the gas hisses through centrifuges spinning faster than a jet engine. Security cameras watch every movement. One mistake here? Isn't just expensive, it's radioactive. But to get here, uranium had to survive a brutal transformation. Buried deep beneath the surface of Kazakhstan's steppes, Canada's Al Habaska Basin, and Australia's deserts, lies a rock that quietly changed the modern world. Uranium ore, dense metallic gray and faintly radioactive, looks kind of unassuming at first glance. But inside this heavy mineral, only a tiny fraction matters. Just 0.7% is uranium-235, the rare isotope capable of sustaining a nuclear chain reaction. The rest, uranium-238, is practically inert by comparison. Miners extract thousands of tons of ore just to collect enough usable material for the next phase. The rock is crushed and tucked away in barrels, but at this stage, it's still useless for power or weaponry. It can't be used in reactors, it can't detonate, this isn't exactly fuel, yet. But buried inside, the future of nuclear energy is already waiting to be unlocked. But before it can spin through centrifuges, it's first got to become a powder. The raw uranium ore isn't ready for anything. Not energy, not enrichment, not danger. First, it's crushed into a fine gravel and fed into chemical baths. Through a process called leaching, acids or alkaline solutions pull the uranium out, separating it from useless rock and minerals that don't go boom. What's left is then transformed again, dried, filtered, and converted into a soft yellow powder, uranium oxide, known across the industry as yellow cake. It looks kind of harmless. It's not. Though it's only slightly radioactive, this is the first stage of nuclear concentration. Drums of yellow cake lined facility walls, stacked, sealed, and stamped with radiation symbols. And every drum tells a story of scale. About 200 tons of ore are needed just to make one ton of yellow cake. From here, things accelerate. The powder will soon become a gas, and the risk begins to rise faster than your dad eating liver and onions. Here's an interesting part. Before it can spin through centrifuges, it has to first become unstable gas. Yellow cake might look like a final product, but it's still pretty unusable. To enrich it, the uranium has to become a gas. So the powder is loaded into high temperature reactors and exposed to fluorine gas, which triggers a chemical reaction that transforms it into uranium hexafluoride, a compound that's volatile, corrosive, and almost alien in its behavior. At room temperature, it's a white crystalline solid, but slightly warmed, it turns into a dense gas that is perfect for centrifuge separation. This transformation isn't just about chemistry, it's about control. Every step requires extreme precision. Impurities can stall the entire enrichment line. Workers wear these full hazmat gear sets, and the entire facility is built to withstand accidental leaks. Because this gas isn't just dangerous, it's the gateway to unlocking nuclear potential. And once it's ready, it's time to start spinning. But inside of these machines, the difference between atoms is barely measurable and everything starts to come together. Once transformed into gas, uranium enters the heart of enrichment, the centrifuge cascade. Each centrifuge spins at up to 70,000 revolutions per minute, creating an artificial gravity over 100,000 times stronger than Earth's. This immense force nudges the slightly lighter U-235 isotopes toward the center, while the heavier U-238 atoms are pushed outward. But here's the crazy thing. One centrifuge isn't enough. To raise the U-235 concentration from 0.7% to 3-5%, to the gas has to pass through thousands of centrifuges, arranged in tight sequences called cascades. This entire process is delicate. Any mechanical imbalance, impurity, or temperature fluctuation could cause catastrophic failure. Rotors are made from carbon fiber or miraging steel, engineered to survive stress very few minerals and materials can endure. What's being separated is measured in microns, but the consequences of failure span continents. But how enriched it becomes doesn't just define its purpose, it defines its destructive potential. Not all enriched uranium is the same. At around 3-5%, U-235 is considered low enriched, which can be just enough to sustain a controlled chain reaction in nuclear power plants. But once that concentration level passes 20%, 
it crosses into highly enriched territory. And that's a level that sparks global alarms. Now that's because nuclear weapons require uranium enriched to 90% or more U-235. The difference here is way more than chemistry. It's geopolitics. Nations enriching uranium beyond power plant levels face intense international scrutiny, triggering inspections, sanctions, or even worse. The International Atomic Energy Agency monitors facilities worldwide to ensure enrichment stays within peaceful bounds. One number, the percentage of U-235, decides whether a shipment of uranium is seen as energy or as a threat. And once that number climbs too high, even atoms become political weapons. Because when missiles and warheads threaten nations, every gram becomes a matter of control. Enrichment isn't just technical. At this stage, it's very much political. Every enrichment facility is under constant surveillance with inspectors from the International Atomic Energy Agency conducting routine and surprise checks. Cameras, motion detectors, and seals monitor movement across every stage of the process. Absolutely nothing is left to chance. Each gram of enriched uranium is logged, weighed, and tracked. Even minor discrepancies can trigger international investigations. That's because a few kilograms of highly enriched uranium could, in theory, be enough to build a weapon. Leaks aren't accidents, they're treated as nuclear theft. Some countries built entire underground enrichment sites to avoid detection. Others open their doors to prove innocence. But either way, one fact remains. Once uranium is enriched, secrecy becomes as essential as precision. Energy isn't the only thing that's at stake here. There's global trust too, along with the thin line between power and provocation. Once enriched and secured, the uranium must be reshaped into something that reactors can actually use. Here, the gas is no longer needed. After enrichment, uranium hexafluoride is cooled and chemically converted into a dark, dense powder, uranium dioxide. This powder is dried and pressed into tiny pellets, each no bigger than a fingertip, yet powerful enough to generate intense heat inside a reactor. These pellets are baked at over 1400 degrees Celsius in a process called sintering, which hardens them into ceramic-like cylinders. Then, they're stacked into long tubes made of zirconium alloy chosen for its resistance to heat and corrosion. These tubes, fuel rods, are bundled together into precise fuel assemblies. Each assembly holds the energy potential of tons of coal, but with none of the emissions. What began as unstable gas is now stable, structured, and ready to power cities or submarines for years to come. But not everything enriched is kept. Some of it is cast aside or redefined. After U-235 is extracted, what's left behind is mostly U-238, the heavier, less reactive isotope. This material is known as depleted uranium. It can't sustain a chain reaction, so it's useless for nuclear power or bombs. But that doesn't mean that it's become harmless. Depleted uranium is still radioactive, and its high density, which is about 1.7 times heavier than lead, makes it uniquely valuable in military applications. It's used to strengthen tank armor and create armor-piercing projectiles, known as kinetic energy penetrators capable of slicing through steel with sheer momentum. Most of it, though, is stored really carefully and is tracked and monitored for future use or disposal. In the enrichment process, even waste isn't ordinary. What's left behind is still very potent, extremely controversial, and still part of the nuclear legacy. Nothing is ever really truly discarded. In uranium's journey, precision and control isn't just technical, it's geopolitical and deeply strategic. It's not all scientific breakthrough, though. It's a strategic monopoly. Only a handful of nations, the US, Russia, France, and China, maintain full-scale enrichment capabilities. That exclusivity gives them enormous leverage, both economically and politically. Other countries have to import nuclear fuel or rely on international agreements. But when nations like Iraq develop their own centrifuge programs, the world takes notice. That's because enrichment is the choke point, the moment where peaceful energy can, in theory, become weaponized. Controlling enrichment is controlling nuclear destiny. It's why inspections are strict, export licenses are rare, and treaties like the Non-Proliferation Treaty are fiercely debated. The enrichment process itself is hidden behind walls and codes, but its impact plays out on global stages where one facility's upgrade can shift international relations overnight.